everyone. Oh, it didn't want to go. Uh, next. Okay. This is our slide um, talking about some of the housekeeping things for HD. Um, neither Chris nor I have any relationships to disclose. Um, but I do want to talk about how we're going to spend our time together for this next hour or so. Um, we do have a little louder, a little closer to the mic. Okay. Boop. Take it off. Um, we do have some slides. Um, I think I have like five, so really not very many slides. He has a few more, but his talk is way more complicated than mine. Um, I am going to do the basics of HD genetics just to make sure everyone's on the same page. I know most of you probably have heard this a billion times already. Um, I won't make it too long and drawn out, I promise, but I do want to make sure we're all on the same page. And then um, we're going to introduce some kind of newer concepts around the genetics of Huntington's disease and talk about genetic and non-genetic modifiers in more detail and how this, influ how this information can influence genetic testing in the future. At the end of our slide presentation, we're going to do a little informal Q&A where Leora is going to ask us some questions that we're going to, we've given a little bit of thought to, but you guys can help us think about them some more and there's going to be questions from the audience as well. Um, so just some of the basics. Again, most of you have seen this before, but you know our body's made of cells. Every cell has the genetic material. Your genetic material is your DNA. It's your code. It makes you who you are. Your DNA is teeny tiny. We cannot see DNA under a microscope. The only time we actually can see our genetic material is when that DNA packages itself up into these small packages we call chromosomes. And the picture that's all beautiful and colorful where things are in pairs, that's what our chromosomes look like. And I like to show that picture to remind us all that we have two copies of everything in our genetic material. Well, except for men. You guys have an X and a Y chromosome, so you don't really have, because girls have two Xs. Um, but the gene for Huntington's disease does live at the top of chromosome number four. And if you look at the top of chromosome number four, you think, okay, that's, oh, that's a little space. There's thousands of genes up there. <laughs> um, so Huntington's disease is one of those conditions where it's dominantly inherited, meaning you only need one abnormal copy of the gene. And that gene um, has a job, just like every gene in our body. Some of them make you know, enzymes that help us digest our food, all kinds of jobs in our body. The protein that gets made in Huntington's disease is called Huntington. I know, it's a very original name. It has an I, though, instead of an O, so just to make it a little bit different. And uh, for a long time, we thought that, that figuring out what that Huntington protein did was going to help us figure out how to cure Huntington's disease, and it turns out it's very complex. So some more, some more things you need to know to be able to follow along with his more complex conversation is going to be the CAG numbers. And when we talk about CAGs, we're talking about cytosine, adenine, guanine. These are bases that are part of the DNA molecule. That's the, um, the double helix. If you think about that part, that's the, I like, I think of a ladder, honestly. And I twist that ladder in my mind. And the part that I'm holding onto on the sides of that ladder is the sugar phosphate backbone. That doesn't matter for today's conversation. But the part that you're walking on, the rungs, those are the bases. And those are the cytosine, adenine, guanine. Cytosine, adenine, guanine, repeating themselves over and over again. It's totally normal. We all have these CAG repeats. We have them in many, many of our genes. And all of us, even if we don't have Huntington's in our family, have CAG repeats in the Huntington's disease gene. It's just that you, if you have, don't have Huntington's disease, you have two normal copies that would be less than 26 CAG repeats. So an example would be 17 and 21 would be a normal result, because again, you have two copies. Then someone who actually has Huntington's disease would have one normal copy they got from their unaffected parent, and then they have an abnormal copy, which is 40 or more of those CAG repeats. And then there's the stuff in the middle. <laughs> Um, 27 to 35 repeats when I'm doing genetic counseling, I'm talking to people about most of the time we don't see people having disease when they have this range of CAG repeats, but we do worry about their descendants. There's a couple of case reports, of course, that always make things a little more interesting. Um, and then there's reduced penetrance, which is between 36 and 39 repeats. And these folks tend to be people who show up in our clinic a little bit later they seem to have a, a slower progression almost to their disease too. Um, and we, again, worry about their descendants inheriting a bigger number 
Um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment here. Page down. Um, dominant inheritance means basically that we see it in every generation. You've all heard of those genetic conditions where people are unaffected carriers. This is not one of those. Huntington's disease, if you have the gene, you're actually going to get the disease assuming you live long enough. And when we think about dominant inheritance, it just means we're seeing it from parent to child to the grandchild. Um, and men and women are all affected. Men pass it to men, men pass it to women, women pass it to women, women pass it to men. It doesn't matter. And I know sometimes in families, when I'm talking to people, they'll say, well, only the women in my family get HD. And sometimes families look like that, <laughs> but it is really still 50-50. Um, the diagram where you have the little people <laughs> and the dad has the condition and the mom does not, um, you can see that the X is the abnormal gene. In this case, it's the Huntington's disease gene. And when he passes that on, that person is affected. When he doesn't pass it on, the person is unaffected, hence the whole 50-50 thing. Remember, when we make babies, we don't get to pass on all of our genetic material. We only get to give one copy or the other. Um, so let's talk a little bit more just about, um, well, dominant inheritance, I, I think I've covered that pretty well. But the one thing that I get a lot of questions about is, which parent you inherit it from actually does make a difference. If you inherit the gene from your mom, you tend to inherit about the same number of CAGs as your mom. About. Have I seen expansions through mom? Yes. <laughs> um, but typically, when you inherit the gene from your dad, you can inherit the same number as your dad, but we do see an increased risk for you inheriting a bigger number or an expansion or anticipation is another word we use for it. And we know there's a correlation between the number of those CAG repeats and the age of onset. So the bigger the expansion gets, the earlier the age of onset starts. Um, so let's move on to my next slide. OK, so Chris is going to talk about all these sort of genetic modifiers with Huntington's disease. And when I'm doing genetic counseling sessions, I talk about his genetic modifiers um, that are fascinating. But I also talk about what are the things that people ask me all the time, what can I do to slow the progression of this disease, or how can I do better with this disease? And the things that I talk about, honestly, number one thing I think we've seen over the years is exercise, regular exercise. You don't have to become a marathon runner, <laughs> um, but just getting out and walking and moving every day is a great, um, a great way to help yourself. Eating a heart-healthy diet, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Um, very wise woman, Dr. Wheelock told me that, and I've remembered it ever since. So if you think about blood vessels, right, and thinking about getting nutrients and things to different um, organs in your body, like your heart or your brain, um, think about things staying healthier, basically, <laughs> if you can, you know, eat a heart-healthy diet and keep your blood vessels from being plugged up. And then this one is a hard one, plenty of sleep and regular sleep. Like your brain loves it, I guess, when you go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. I wouldn't know what that's like because I can't do it. <laughs> but, um, but I think that that's an important thing we see for our families. And then avoiding um, brain injury from the inside and the outside. And when I say from the inside, I'm talking about, you know, avoiding becoming a drug addict or an alcoholic or things that are going to be neurotoxic to your brain. Um, and then from the outside, maybe not taking up that career in kickboxing or NFL football or you know wearing a bike helmet, those kinds of things. Um, managing your mental health, staying as, as in the game as you can. Um, I know Huntington's disease poses many, many challenges, but just taking care of yourself. We have therapies um, and medications that can help people um, do better with their mental health that then allows them to do better with the other symptoms of the disease. And then recently there's been more emphasis and studies on socialization. That people with like um, cognitive decline can be thwarted a bit if you can stay engaged. I just think about it that I can predict what my Sudoku game's gonna kinda do, but I can't predict what you're gonna say to me, so my brain has to work harder to, think about, to respond to you than to play my Sudoku game. Probably good to do all of it, <laughs> but um, that I think is the end of my, yep, this is the part where Chris is gonna take over and blow your minds with all the really cool science stuff. <laughs> Thank
Thank you, Mara. Sorry, I want to adjust this so I can use my hands. OK. Can everyone hear me? OK. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the CAG repeat, the number that comes on that sheet of paper, the proverbial sheet of paper when people get testing, whether they get testing because they want a diagnosis or because they know it runs in their family. Um, there's actually a lot of information around what that CAG repeat is and various nuances with the CAG repeat. So when we were sort of brainstorming this session, I, I uh, decided that I would give you a little bit of a around the world tour of what we know about the CAG repeat. And there's actually a lot of cutting edge science like specifically about the repeat. So even though it was discovered 30 years ago, um, the story actually continues to evolve. So uh, as Mara said, there are lifestyle factors that can influence the progression of HD, but uh, as scientists in genetics, it's a genetic disease, we, we spend a lot of energy looking at what are genetic modifiers. So a genetic modifier is something in your genome that changes how HD progresses. So you have the expansion, that's the diagno diagnosis of HD, um, but the length of the repeat also influences when HD occurs, how it can progress. Um, there are interruptions in the repeat that we now know can also affect how the disease presents. And there are changes in other genes elsewhere in your genome, so not in Huntington, that also can affect um, how, how HD presents. So I'm gonna start from the basics and build on up. So if you don't have, no, you know, if you can't follow along with everything by the end, do not worry about it. The, the idea is to give you a, a full range of um, what, what is being worked on uh, in HD genetics right now concerning the repeat. So as Mara said, we have two copies of every gene in our body, except for those on the X chromosome, the Y chromosome, uh, in the case of men. Um, <laughs> we're missing half of it. Um, and that holds true for Huntington as well. So we have two copies of Huntington. We also have two copies of the CAG repeat. Everyone in this room has two copies of a CAG repeat in Huntington, um, like is depicted on the slide here. And in a person who tests positive for HD, they have one that we call wild type or uh, typical um, that has a shorter number of CAG repeats and one that has a longer number of CAG repeats, which we call the HD copy because there's one copy of the two that has that expansion. Um, and as Mara had mentioned, uh, anything that is below 27 repeats, we call normal. Um, and everyone has a, a random number. Well, not random, I'll show you in a few slides. Um, but most people in the general population have repeats below 27. Uh, in the case of someone who tests positive for HD, they will have 36 or more when it's um, tested. Um, and so here, for example, uh, are 42, and at the top there's 17 in, in red. Uh, and these occur in the same place in your genome, in this gene, Huntington. So you'll notice that the sequence before the red is pretty much, it's, it's the same in both of these, right? So the sequence before the repeat is the same in both copies, and the sequence after the repeat is typically the same in, in both copies. There is also this uh, CCG repeat in the bold you see, and that actually varies a little bit between people, but it doesn't cause disease. So there's a little bit of change elsewhere in the gene, but really the main change in the Huntington gene that we care about clinically has to do with the length of the repeat. So <laughs> one thing that comes up again and again, I was sort of brainstorming what are various questions that come up about the CAG repeat, and one is that people don't really know how we measure it. So I just want to give you sort of a, a, a general idea of when we say we size the repeat, like what does that even mean? So what we do is we take DNA out of cells, typically it's from a blood sample, and we do what's called a, a PCR, which is a lab technique for creating a fragment based off of part of your genome. And that's really all you need to know about it without going into the details. So in the case of a normal repeat, 
Um, so here in red is those CAG repeats that I showed you before, and the sequence after it is these various other uh, triplets um, encoded in different colors based on what the triplet is with that CCG at the very end that I mentioned. What you'll do from PCR is you'll make a fragment based on that chunk of DNA from the blood sample. And then you measure the length of the fragment. So it's sort of a two-step thing. You start with the genomic DNA, the DNA from a person's blood sample, and then you create this fragment based off of how long that repeat is. And so when you have an expanded repeat, you also do that same um, uh, exper experimental protocol, that same test, and it just creates a longer fragment. So basically when we test for HD, what we're doing is we're really measuring the length of this fragment in black relative to each other and relative to, you know, you have like a, a, a ladder, a size standard to measure it against. So we're not actually going into the DNA and like measuring it in the DNA. We actually create this fragment from the DNA and then look at how long that fragment is. And I'm also going into this into a little bit of detail because it now matters for um, certain diagnostics we're going to talk about. So some of you in the room may know about this range of CAG repeats uh, that Mara also alluded to. So anything that's uh, 26 or less is called a normal repeat. 27 to 35 is called an intermediate allele, an intermediate repeat, which itself won't cause HD, but can expand in your children, typically the children of fathers, which I'll mention in the next slide or two. Then you have these two categories of HD repeats. Uh, the first one is called reduced penetrance, so 36 to 39 repeats. It basically means you may or may not get, get HD with these repeats. And then 40 and above, which we call full penetrance, meaning that it's highly likely, almost certain, you will get HD if you have 40 and above. Um, so intermediate alleles, intermediate repeats, uh, can expand in the next generation. So if, if someone does a genetic test and they have an intermediate repeat, uh, particularly if they are a father, it can expand into the HD range in the next generation. Um, this is very, very rare from mothers. Uh, it's most of the time when we see a new HD case, one that has emerged from this process on, on the right here, from a father to a son or a father to a daughter, it's almost always from a father. Um, so as Mara said, uh, typically if, you are, if, if HD is running in the family, for example, yes, you can get HD from your mother. But if it's totally brand new, if there's been no HD in the family before, it usually comes from a father. So this is where the genetics gets cool. So I'm gonna start to get into some actual data. And I'm gonna go through it really, really slowly. I realize this is an audience with different like knowledge levels, and, um, uh, but there's some really cool aspects to data uh, about the CAG repeat in the past few years that I wanna get into. So I'm gonna start with this. So this was a study that I actually did um, quite some time ago now, where we took a whole bunch of people from the population. No, you know, no one who, who had previously known HD, just a bunch of people from the general public and we looked at all their CAG repeats. We did that test, that little fragment test, on like 7,340 people. Um, and what was interesting is we got frequencies of how often those, those C repeats in the different range occur in just the general public. Um, and so intermediate alleles are actually pretty common. They occur in about one in 16 people. Um, when you start getting into the HD range, they become less frequent. So that 36 to 39 that I called the reduced penetrance range, we estimated that it's about one in 500 people, which is actually surprisingly high considering that that's not all those people come to the clinic. Like actually only some of those people actually get HD. Um, and then for 40 and above, we estimated that it was about one in 2,500 people. So the length of the repeat that you inherit, it was understood very early on that it has this relationship to, in general, when people get HD. 
So this was a plot put together about, wow, 20 years ago now. And this was generated from thousands and thousands of Huntington disease patients and, and clinical data about when they first developed symptoms, what was their CAG repeat number. And what was seen was that as the repeat gets longer and longer, the average age that you develop HD, you start to get symptoms of HD, it gets younger and younger. So people with shorter repeats will develop it later at an older age, and people with longer repeats will develop it at an earlier age. And it's this clean relationship. It seems to just become younger and younger with each additional CAG repeat. And so what this allowed us to do was actually to say, well, what would be the expected or average onset for a given CAG repeat? So for someone who has a 43, for example, on average, they first get symptoms of HD around 48 years of age. But this is just an average. And that's one reason that this, tip, this typically isn't reported to people when they get a genetic test. So you'll get the CAG repeat number, but a genetic counselor generally won't tell you when you might get HD. They, they will say, well, we don't really know. It might be similar to how it was in your family in previous generations or in siblings. We don't really know. Um, because there are always people who present very early, and there's always people who present very late for a given repeat length. So even if someone has, you know, on the, in this case, like a 46, they could really present anywhere between 30 and 60 years of age. So these are just averages. But there still is a predictive value to the CAG repeat number. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is that people with these 36 to 39 repeats, they, they usually present late in life, right? And they don't always present with HD. So it kind of left open this question. There's been this question in the field for a long time, like, well, why do people with 36 to 39 only sometimes present HD? And one potential explanation is that maybe they just don't live long enough. Like maybe if people didn't die of cancer or heart disease, that they would eventually go on to develop HD. But as you can see from the, the line, with 36, they'd have to be like 100 years old <laughs> to get HD. So maybe people in the population who have 36 to 39 would develop HD if they just lived longer. And maybe the ones that do develop HD are just the ones that happen to be presenting earlier than the rest. Um, some more details about these, whoops, 36 to 39 repeats. So they're not very common in, a, in the clinic. So we did a study um, in uh, British Columbia. So I work in Vancouver, by the way, in um, University of British Columbia, where we basically counted up all the HD patients in the whole province. It was a monumental effort, and some of that work ended up in the, uh, the paper that I um, uh, cite here in the lower right, where we looked at how many patients are there with these 36 to 39, and how old are they generally? So about 5% of people who come to an HD clinic have 36 to 39, and they're usually over the age of 65. So it's a smaller number than most people with HD, and they tend to present later in life. So this leads into some of what the work has been done on genetic modifiers. So when you're looking for things that might explain why people develop HD early or late, you can look at their genomes. There's other things in your genetics that affect all kinds of things about you, right? Like how tall you are, what is your eye color, um, whether you like um, cilantro or not, right? There's all kinds of things in your genome that have real effects. So we go fishing for these things in order to explain maybe why someone develops HD early or late. And it's actually been very fruitful. This work has been phenomenally successful in the past 10 years. And they really fall into two categories. So category one is looking at changes in other genes in your genome. So, you know, I realize this plot on the top is a really like complicated sciencey plot, but all you really need to care about is on the bottom where it says chromosome. There's like one, two, three, four, five, six. This is looking at changes in your genome across all your chromosomes. And the ones that have these spikes 
are basically changes that are associated with whether someone presents early or late. So when they went on this fishing expedition, they found all these other genes in the genome that actually are associated with people who present HD earlier or later than you would expect based on their CAG number. So these are all interesting potential drug targets because it's like, well, why are these other things in the genome causing HD to present earlier or late? Maybe we could learn something about how the disease progresses and develop drug targets out of that. The second category, which um, is really the focus of a lot of my work, is looking at changes in the Huntington gene that also cause people to present early or late. And some of those changes are right in that repeat region. So right where the CEG repeat is and that other CCG repeat that I mentioned to you earlier, there's changes in that region that actually have this big effect on whether people present early or late. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that second category. So, this sequence on the top is actually the same sequence that I showed you all earlier that has like the CAG repeat at the beginning and then that CCG repeat at the end. And there's this little chunk of DNA in the middle that we call an interruption because it, it interrupts those two repeats. And the first one is, it's a CAA. It basically breaks up this larger CAG repeat and it occurs in almost everyone. Almost everyone has this interruption. But in people who have very early onset of HD, they present much earlier than other patients, a lot of them have a loss of those interruptions. So rather than the sequence on the top that we see in almost everyone, including people in the general population, uh, instead they've, they've lost those interruptions and the two repeats just become these like pure repeats. So rather than this interrupted sequence on the top, we have just a CAG repeat and just a CCG repeat. And these, <laughs> when we're talking about the change, so first off, oh yeah, just some terminology. So we call this uh, a CAG loss of interruption with a CCG loss of interruption. And so we don't have to say this over and over and over again, we make an abbreviation, and the abbreviation is a CAG CCG LOI. Some people call this different terms, but we find this is like the most concise way of describing what this change is. And people who have this change, we've now looked at quite a few of them, they present on, on average about 13 years earlier than expected, which is huge. Uh, it's, oh. So we're gonna have an amazing Q&A session at the end where we can bounce all these questions off each other and more as well. Um, so 13 years, it's, it's really a very large effect. Um, you might have seen from the slide before this that those modifiers elsewhere in the genome, they do have an effect, but the effect individually of each of them is actually not that big. It's like a year, half a year, um, whereas this change seems to have a really profound effect. So we're doing a lot of work in Vancouver. Other groups around the world are also doing work on what does this change do? Like, why would people with this one genetic change next to the CAG repeat present so much earlier? We really don't know yet. But there's a few interesting clues. And so I'm going to go into a couple of them. So there's a reason that I sort of dwelt on those reduced penetrance repeats, the CAG 36 to 39. The reason is that when we look at people in that range, most of them have this change. So this change that causes people to present early, it's, it occurs in, so for example, if someone is, gets a genetic test and they have a 36 or a 37, we find that almost all of them have this change. So that's really, really provocative. So remember what I was saying earlier that maybe people in this range just don't live long enough to develop first symptoms of HD? Well, this is saying that's probably, that, that, that theory is probably right because all of these people who actually end up coming to clinic with those repeats have this variant that causes early onset. It's really remarkable. Um, so right now, it's, we're, we're heading into a little bit of terra incognita with these, these, these variants. 
And I'm going to explain to you briefly why right now it's a little bit of a problem from a diagnostic standpoint of knowing whether someone has this change, you know, is it picked up when you get a genetic test? So remember what I was saying about the fragment, right, about how we do the genetic testing. So here's someone who would have like 39 CAG repeats and they get this fragment and based on the length of that fragment we say, oh, they have 39. But we're not actually going in and looking at the DNA directly. We're just looking at how long that chunk of DNA is, right? And as you may have noticed already, this variant, this CAG CCG LOI, it actually causes the CAG repeat to get a bit longer. But based on that fragment that we look at, the fragment is the same size. So it's, it's actually two CAG repeats longer, but the, the little chunk of DNA doesn't change in length. It's the same length, the chunk of DNA that we use to make the fragment. So right now, that person gets a diagnostic test of 39, when really they have 41 CAG repeats. So there's probably a lot of people out there with this 36 to 39 that when you talk about how many actual CAG repeats they have one after another, it's actually two more. But we don't really have a great way of establishing this right now. And so there's a lot of discussion right now about how to integrate this sort of information into testing. Um, so some last things about the CAG CCG LOI. So it actually leads, leads to earlier onset all the way across the range of CAG repeats. So this is not an effect that happens just at that 36 to 39 range. We've looked at a lot of patients at various sizes. So the way to look at this plot is see the dashed black line. The dashed black line is that plot I showed you earlier about how when people get longer CAG repeats, they tend to get HD earlier and earlier, right? And basically, irrespective of how long that CAG repeat is um, um, that people t are tested for, they generally will still present HD T about 10 to 12 years earlier than you would expect for that CAG repeat. It just happens that it occurs more frequently in people who have 36 to 39. So again, like I said, this sort of intriguing hypothesis that's been around for a long time, why do only some people with 36 to 39 present HD? Well, it might be that having this variant causes them to present HD within a normal human lifespan. And if we just lived longer, by fixing cancer and heart disease and all the other things that we all uh, end up um, with at the end of our lives, maybe people, a whole bunch of other people would actually end up getting HD who don't right now. We don't know. And one last piece of information that really makes us confident about this idea that maybe they just don't live long enough. Remember this plot I showed you before where we looked at all the repeats in the general population? So these are just Joe Public right, the 7,000 something people that we looked at? Well, we got HD alleles from that group of people. We got more reduced penetrance alleles than full penetrance alleles. And we genotyped all of them, we, we sequenced all of them, and none of them have the CAG CCG LOI. So it's only the people who come to clinic with these 36 to 39 that seem to have this variant. In the general public, it's not very frequent at all. It's rare, very, very rare. So um, this is my last slide, and then we're gonna get into some provocative questions. Um, we now have a couple of really, really interesting cases where it sort of puzzled us, but now we may have an explanation as to what's going on. So there are a few case studies in our group as well as from other research groups of people who get testing and they get a 35. And they're often like the first person in their family to get HD. So there's this big question, is it really HD? Like if they have a 35, but it's, and it's not been in their family before, maybe they just have something else, right? Well, we had two cases like this, where they, they got testing back at 35. And like I said, with that change in, in, the, uh, in the repeat, they actually have 37. And based on 37, you would expect them to present at 85 years of age. But they actually present in their 60s. 
and they both have the C, this CAG CCG LOI. So this variant seems to offer an explanation as to why some people at this very, very low number of CAG repeats may present Huntington disease. So we're gonna have a little bit of structured discussion about some of this, and then we're gonna have the open Q&A where we can answer anything under the sun that you're curious about. Um, and uh, I also want to very much thank HDSA for putting this together. It was, uh, I don't know whose idea it was originally, but when it came along, I said, yes. Thanks to both our speakers. Um, we've got a little less than 15 minutes left in this session. So um, I do want to get to audience questions, but I do think that I'll start with, with one question for, for both of you. Yeah. So. Um, first, I want to ask a little bit about how this information impacts people on a practical basis with genetic counseling. So do these modifiers impact counseling um, and people who are testing for the HD gene? What do you, what do you share with people as, as part of this and, and how would that affect your practice, Mara? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, when I do genetic counseling for people who are, you know, considering testing, um, I definitely talk about the different modifiers. And everybody says to me, I would say 95% of the people say to me, how do I get those? How do I get those tests done? And I'm like, well, unfortunately, it's still in the research realm. Um, and we don't have the good enough information to be able to counsel you appropriately about what the results will mean. I think we're getting closer, you know, Chris's data is showing us that, and I would feel more confident counseling somebody with a 13 year um, difference in age of onset than I would one to five years, which, um, you know, it's fascinating. People are very interested, you know, we talk, talk a lot a bit about the, the other genes that are outside of the Huntington's disease genes. A lot of them are actually, um, related to cancer, <laughs> believe it or not, they're DNA repair type genes. And people are always fascinated to learn more about that. Um, but again, one to five years, I can't tell you that that's not what's just normally naturally gonna happen to you anyways, right? So. Thanks, I, maybe I'll do one question for, for Chris as well and then we'll move to audience Q&A. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you you talked about some of the modifiers in other genes where there's, you know, tiny little changes that cause changes in onset. And then you talked about the ones that you study in the Huntington gene. So can you talk about what the difference is between those and, you know, how they might make HD better or worse? Yeah, so um, as Mar alluded to, um, there's actually a large number of the changes in other genes that are related to these genes implicated in cancer. And why is that? Well, because cancer actually is, um, it's, it's a disease of aberrant DNA, like DNA that doesn't get repaired normally. Like basically cancer is just your genome has gone haywire. And we now know that DNA repair is actually very closely connected to how long the repeat gets in your body. There's this connection mechanistically between DNA repair, pathways related to DNA repair, and how long the repeat gets in different cells of your body, including neurons. And this is a huge, huge field of investigation in HD research right now. I mean, all the best and the brightest are really focused on why is this the case and how do we leverage this to make drug targets. The really interesting thing is that the variants that are in the repeat they don't seem to actually act through that pathway. So that's one reason why in Vancouver, we're really fascinated by them and a few other groups as well, because it may actually point to other things in HD that also are drug targets. So there's many things that go wrong in Huntington disease. And we wanna make sure that we have real strong proof at a genetic level as to what is a good drug target. We don't wanna just pick it out of the hat. We wanna have something that is actually shown in people through their genetics to make a difference, right? So, um, so there may be many different drug target avenues, but we're hoping that looking at this sequence variant that has this huge effect on onset will eventually lead us to finding some important pathway to developing a, drug, a new drug, drug target, yeah. 
I'm going to pass it to the audience. Do you guys have two microphones there or just one? Okay, maybe we'll take, can we, oh, I don't know which one is, okay. All right, I see a hand in the front over here. Yes, uh, the question I have is with somatic instability and onset and repeat length, are they all correlated or are they completely separate issues? So that, this is a great question. I didn't get into somatic instability because there is a lot of, um, a lot of data that I'd have to kind of get into and I, you know, just constraints of time. So the, the interesting thing is that a lot of these modifiers elsewhere in the genome that uh, are related to DNA repair, they seem to be closely tied to somatic instability and mechanisms of somatic instability. Um, but right now, we don't really have that smoking gun of somatic instability from, from brain tissue, like from people to show us that the somatic instability is directly related to changes in onset. There's a lot of suggestive data. I don't mean to deny that. But um, we, we still need to develop some more of the supporting data from human, human in, uh, patients uh, in order to, to really connect the dots. It's, it's a little bit complex right now. CAG repeat is uh, 51, and he's completely normal right now. He might have a little tick here and there, and the speech maybe just, you know, a little slur like drinking, but other than that, there's nothing, there's no so uh, onset. One of the things I was just going to say, for, first of all, people in the room may not know the term somatic instability since we didn't talk about it. Um, <laughs> But um, somatic instability is this phenomenon where I used to counsel people all the time that the number of CAG repeats you got from your mom and your dad are your numbers your whole life and they're never going to change and they're in every part of your body and that's not true. Um, it turns out in our brain and in other tissues as well there um, is an increase in the number of these CAG repeats to, to very large numbers like in the hundreds, right? You know, the numbers of CAG repeats in the brain. And as a clinician, you know, I think okay, well, if someone got a, a, a cell in a part of the brain that's more impacted by, by like movement, maybe that's why they have more movement symptoms than their brother or sister who has the same number of repeats. Um, so to me, you know, thinking about your question, I'm like, well, maybe he's been lucky that he hasn't had, you know, any of these hits in areas that would impact him in terms of having symptoms. I see another question in the front here. Um, mine is twofold. The um, the repeat from 36 to 39, is that almost guaranteed to be passed on? And the number two question, uh, what country seems to be the most affected? Because I see, of course, on Facebook, a, a lot of people in England, a lot of people in Germany. Uh, is there any one area that has more than the other? Um, so I'm going to start with question number two first. So there are big differences in terms of uh, ethnic ancestry, in terms of the prevalence of HD. So HD is very rare in people of East Asian ancestry, Asian ancestry. Um, it seems to be uncommon, but also somewhat rare in people of African ancestry. And then it is more common in people of European ancestry. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry, question one again? Yes. Um, so basically, as the repeat gets longer, it has a propensity to expand more. So it can go back. Basically, if, if, if a father has, let's say a father has a 36, it could actually go back into the intermediate range in one or more of his, his children. But it could also expand. It can go both directions. And basically, as the repeat gets longer and longer, it becomes more of a bias towards expansion. Question in the front over here. That was timely, because my question is about this difference between men and women. 
And I'm curious if there's any research going on around, as you were talking, my brain started chewing on that. Cause I was like, that's fascinating. Why does that happen? Is it because you are born with all of the eggs that you will ever have? Yes. Right. Can you <laughs> as, explain maybe that a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah. As women, you know, we are born with um, all of our eggs in our ovaries, right? And so it's a pretty stable process. Every month we're releasing one. Men, on the other hand, are making millions and millions of sperm every day. And it's just a more error laden process. And that's why they think there's this increased incidence of expansion when you inherit it from your father. Got another question back here. Maybe we'll do two more. Mara, um, what level of confidence do you need from Chris and his team to start encouraging additional testing? Because it seems like we're there, but but you're not confident enough. So like, when are, when are we there? There's a couple of issues. Um, one is that right now, the way that we do DNA testing, right, he was explaining is we're taking fragments and measuring that up against, oh, that fragment size means you have 42 repeats, right? Um, we'd have to do sequencing. <laughs> we'd have to change all the labs to doing sequencing, and that's a very complex process. There's CLIA involved in terms of, um, so I think it's something that we should start thinking about and working towards, but it's gonna be a process. At CLIA are like diagnostic laboratory standards. So you can't just kind of just decide to open up your own genetic testing lab. You have to be licensed and all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. My, I have a question about different generations. So have you looked to see if this uh, LOI carries from one generation to the next yet? Do you have enough people to be able to look at that? So uh, the answer is yes. What we're more interested in is seeing an instance where it's new. And we haven't seen that. What we've seen is that it runs in families, but we haven't seen an instance of where it's emerged brand new. That's where we really would love to see um, from a scientific standpoint. So what we generally have are families with these variants where it runs within the family. Oops, I saw a question over here. Hi, I'm Christy Figueroa in San Diego. Um, wondering if, so my mother was like the 13th one in our family. We're up to about 20 right now, including myself and my daughter. Um, wondering, so my grandmother didn't have signs of it. Her, her twin did. Is it possible that I have it from my mother? Um, if she didn't have, if her mom, I mean, is it possible that her mom could not have had it? Are you asking if you could have inherited the disease from someone who doesn't have it? I got it from my mom, but I'm wondering, because it says you have to have it from a parent, and her mom had it. Uh -huh. I mean, but her mom didn't have it. Her, her mom's twin had it. Oh, but okay. But her mom didn't, would never had it. I understand the question now. Um, we do see that in, the, in genetics when I'm taking family histories and talking to families, that someone will have a very late onset or a mild onset, or it'll be misdiagnosed, or they'll, be di they'll die in a car accident before they actually show symptoms. Um, or somebody could have inherited, like the twin sister could have inherited 40 repeats, and the other sister could have inherited um, 38 or 39, and there could have been then an expansion in the next generation. So, does that answer your question? You see all these scenarios, like <clears throat> we have hundreds of families in Vancouver that we've studied for decades, and you see all these different combinations of situations where like the inheritance is really clear, or others where no, like we don't know, did the parent have the mutation or not, and they just were late presenters. Uh, we've even seen uh, in instances of non-paternity, like everything under the sun you can imagine, you do see, yeah. Thank, let's thank our speakers one more time. This has been 